Hey everybody. Okay, so today is part two of the origin story. Now part one, we went over kind of my background and how I ended up at the command that I ended up at. I got injured uh, in SEAL training. I then went into special warfare intelligence. I got assigned to this command that I had no business being at with just basically the legends of the SEAL teams. Uh, they were looking at redoing training and where we're going to take up on the interview, I, I overlapped it a little bit from last time because I want to make sure you understand that, you know, I get a call from my DEA buddy as we're doing all this training, trying to find the right background uh, instructor for us who can understand all aspects of combat uh, and hand to hand. And I get this call saying there's a guy two blocks away from where I live in San Diego that is a guy I should look at. And so we're going to take it from there. And we're also talking about the difficulties of certain personality types um, that you have to deal with. And, and again, I found people that have the best information often are very difficult individuals to deal with. But I seem to have a talent for extrapolating out information from these individuals. Uh, if I have a superpower, that's probably it. So let's go ahead and take it back up. Again, this was with Byron Rogers from Protector Nation. And uh, this is part two. This guy ended up you know, bringing people in from all over. This guy literally lived two blocks away from my apartment. You know, like, like his, his studio. This is and like, I'm, like, yeah. I'm like, what? He goes, seriously, he goes, you know, I said, he, they go, he's a real asshole, but you get along with assholes. And he goes, so you should, mm -hmm. you know, you should, you should be great. Be and now, taking that as a compliment, because, you know, I just want to be that really clear. I have found the people that have the best information yeah. are, are usually, they, they don't suffer Very, fools. Yeah, they're, they're eccentric. They're like. Yeah. Well, and back then, this is pre, you know, war. It's a little bit different now with the spec ops community. But I've noticed even the spec ops, spec ops community during peacetime, true warriors were like, you know, hands off. And people, like, it's almost like, you know, break glass in case of war type stuff. Yeah, those yeah, guys, yeah. those guys, I always got along with, you know, and I right. was able to get extrapolate really good information with them. And that's that's kind of what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy was no no exception. Um, I, the, I went down there to look at a studio and I, I swear to God, I would not have come back to the studio because it was this dingy 900 square foot. It didn't even have mats. It had carpet. Oh, you know? man. And I, and I didn't see any training. I didn't see any training going on because it was closed at the time. And I'm yeah. like, oh, there's no way I because listen, you like gotta understand. In the right place. <laughs> well, not only that, but don't only that, you gotta understand. I am the most junior guy on this program. I'm only there because yeah. they invited me. Yeah. And you know, I go, I don't want to come off like some arrogant guy, like, hey, I got the guy, you know, he's there. So I was able to think of that. I go, I, I thought maybe my my buddy in DEA was screwing with me. Mm -hmm. But there was a little trifold that was taped to the inside of the glass. Okay. And I just I went up and I started reading it. And the one thing that got me was this guy was a Vietnam vet, but not only was a Vietnam vet, he was in 173rd Charlie Company of, okay. of, of the, 80, of the uh, 173rd you know, Airborne Unit. Yeah. Those guys, that was Westmoreland, the, the general at that time, it was almost like his experimental troops. He kept them out mm -hmm. in the jungle. They were just, they saw tons of combat. This it. guy in particular was a, uh, was, was, a, uh, um, was a tunnel rat. You know, he would go in and do that. So... Those two things said, you know what? I'm going to make the time to come back. And yeah. so I come back, I, I sit in there, and I kind of have modified uh, grooming standards because I'm, I'm representing the Admiral in a lot of different things, and sometimes we, have to, we had to look civilian. Okay. Then. And uh, so I, I blended in. I kind of looked like a surfer. I didn't say anything about being in the military or anything, and I just went and sat in the back. And I watched yeah. these kids who were out there and they had, they had geese on like traditional, you know, geese on, but like a yellow belt. I remember this one kid in particular who ended up being a really good friend of mine. Still yeah. one of my instruct my instructors that works with us. He had a yellow awesome. belt on. And the first thing I saw him do, a guy came at him. He strikes him to the side of the neck, comb grabs his hair, knees him, knees him to the groin. And then as the guy's coming down to the groin reaction, a knife comes out of nowhere, a rubber knife, but it comes over yeah. nowhere. And he just starts, you know, stabbing Working. the guy, take him down. And I'm Jeez. like, you know, I grew up, my, my, my family's from Boston and my, my mm. great uncles were, uh, um, were, were Boston cops. And my, you know, I was used to, my, my uncles would fight at the drop of a hat, you know, and like that. <laughs> but, it, but, but that type of violence is very different. Um, I tell a story that my, my uncle one time, I'm coming out of a, he's getting a haircut. 
Yeah. And he's got the whole thing, he got the shave, the haircut, the whole deal. And he was dressed in a nice suit. He wasn't a gangster or anything. He actually, you know, was in real estate. And, uh, yeah. but my, my uncle was a tough guy and he comes out and this kid's lying on his, on his Cadillac. <laughs> oh no. He's a, like he's a punk. He, he's a punk. Yeah, yeah just, just, just a punk. Just, punk. Just, <laughs> punk Irish kids, you know, a couple punk Irish kids were there yeah. and laying on it. And he said, and my uncle's kind of calm. He goes, hey, uh, it's my car. Could you get off it? And they're like, what are you going to do about it, old man? And you're like, before oh. The guy, before the guy even even gets it's another finished. word out, my uncle had hit him, took his head, bounced it off of the uh, the front of the, uh, the, the car. Bumper there, yeah. <laughs> bumper, yeah. He's like, boom, boom, boom. Drops him, kicks him twice. The other kid takes off running. Jeez. He gets me in the back of the car. He drives away. He looks back at me and he goes, Hey, don't tell your mother about this. Um, <laughs> so, so, so when I say this, when, yeah. I, when I say the reason I say this is because yeah. I used Not to think foreign. that was normal. You know, yeah. I mean, that's you know, my grandfather. Most other kids are getting taken to the circus. My grandfather, the first thing he got us were boxing gloves and taught us how to box. Yeah. So, so I was very comfortable with that idea. I realized when traveling around as a Navy kid, I realized, oh, guess what? <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't do this all the time. You know, this yeah, is yeah. Uh, this may be unique to my my Irish Boston background here. Um, yes. but the reason I say that is because that triggered right away when I saw this kid, yeah, I go, Hey, this isn't, you know, all the stuff I had was very formatic martial yeah. arts, mostly Korean at mm -hmm. the time, which were great. Got a lot of positive things out of it, but this looked like the real violence I had seen on the streets, the stuff I'd seen people do. And I said, wow, they're, they're mimicking. I've seen stuff like this before and it doesn't look anything like what I've been training. So yeah, I, I was, I was amazed by it. And I end up meeting the instructor. The instructor, I thought he was like the janitor. He comes out, he's got like a big Aloha shirt on. He's like 140 pounds. And he's just kind of looks like a burnout surfer. And he's talking to kids and stuff like that. Well, that was him. That was the guy, you know, and, and his name is Jerry Peterson. And he, he was just, he saw arcs and angles other people didn't see. He wasn't a formerly educated guy, but he understand, he understood injury to the human body. When I saw that, I started training with him for about six months. Um, and then I was training with the, the command guys. Yeah. We were training two to three times a week on whatever was going on. And one of the master chiefs noticed one day, he goes, hey, you've been moving differently. You've been doing things differently. What are you doing? And mm -hmm. I just said, oh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this stuff. What stuff are you doing? I go, well, I've been training with this guy. What guy have you been training with? Yeah, yeah. He's like, guy? give me the answer. I'm looking I'm like, for <laughs> And I was sitting there going, oh, my God, I'm this know-nothing knucklehead that they've invited. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed. Because the other thing that I didn't tell you was mm. this guy hated lifers. He hated people. Like, he was a Vietnam era guy that got drafted. Yeah. And uh -huh. he thought you were a complete idiot if you stayed if in the military. Stayed, like, yeah, like, he had yeah. contempt. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, and in particular, he hates the Navy and he hates the SEALs because he thought they were like glorified in, in Vietnam, didn't yeah. really do the, you know, the real work. So anyway, I had that to deal yeah, with we have all in the back of my head. And, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, man, I'm this thinking, gonna hurt. Do I, am I going to have to really do this? And so I bring him in and what people say a lot of things about about him. And I agree. I'm not on his Christmas card list anymore. Yes, he's a functioning sociopath. But I will tell you one thing: when you can you can criticize his personality all you want, you can't you can't say his methods weren't highly effective. And at the time, it yeah. was, there was nothing like it. Mm. The, the reason he got in was I brought him in, and literally it was like we bring him into the skiff. We did the whole thing, and, and uh, you know he gives a briefing. These guys tracked right right away. They they tracked on his bona fides. They checked them out, and they got his DD two fourteen. They saw all that stuff. They got in and started giving some questions. A lot of the Vietnam era guys knew, you know, where they were operating and there's back mm -hmm. and forth. And they actually had pretty good rapport, which I was like, oh, you're good. You Thank know? God. I'm not. Like, oh, <laughs> man. You know, because I begged right. him. I go, please, please, please. Don't tell me you're real, what you really feel like. I yeah. go, just, just be nice, you know. Well, they had a situation back then. It was uh, then SEAL Team 6. You know, they were, that's, that's how, how everybody knew. But it was then SEAL Team 6. Yeah. They had done a ship boarding um, about four years prior. And I had a couple of guys that were there from that unit. And when they got on the ship, they were going through a hatch. And so, the, you know, it's typical lineup, typical stack up that, that yeah. came in. They're going in to get the bad guys. First guy goes through, lead guy goes through the door. Second guy gets jammed up. He gets jammed up and, you know, a, a bad guy grabs him and is monkeying okay. with him and blocking the rest of the team from getting in. Uh, and the other guy's fighting for his life inside, you know, in there. 
They no. eventually worked it out, but they were saying like, hey, that was the first question they gave him. Yeah. And before they even they finished it, and, and you got to understand, he hadn't done anything since Vietnam there. So it was about probably 15 years. He wasn't up to date on the latest weapons or any of that kind of stuff. He could care less about it. He saw uh-huh. the arc thing. He, he stacked up all these guys and like, you know, I'm talking like, you know, hardcore dudes. They, yeah, they, like they sta- he stacked them up. He comes in, the guy, the, as the second guy comes through the door, they jam him just like the way he was. And Jerry, Jerry looks at the guy who's jammed and he goes, drop back, sit down. Guy drops back, sits down. The guy goes forward, pulling the, the, yeah. the weapon. It was an MP5, goes center line, right on the guy. And you can see, okay, yeah, they would have killed this guy. And the door opened right away and the rest of the guys got in just like that. Man, that's that's what got us into the teams. It wasn't it wasn't, you know, punching and kicking or anything like that. It was literally that. And that's why those guys perked up right away, because that was the missing element. Nobody was able to clearly at that. And and we're talking we're talking 80, 88, 89. Um, At that that point, there was nobody in the community that was having those conversations. And this guy just easily could do it. And that's what started the program. And then, um, you know, we did it for years. We worked, uh, you know, I became an instructor in the military and then I left the military and continued as a contractor with that company. And he and I worked together right till before 9-11. And wow. he just he just had a, a, a break off. And then I thought I was out of the business at that point. And, you know, I was still doing work, but a lot of people started contacting me saying, hey, there's a void here. <laughs> he's not... He's not responding to our calls. He's not doing yeah. seminars. Can you can you just start setting some things up? And I tried to keep it under the original name. He didn't want me to do yeah. that. So that's when I came with Target Folks Training. What was interesting was I never saw myself as a guy. In fact, I still feel that way. I don't. I, I feel like I'm the, the biggest cheerleader for this methodology, yeah. but not the guru stuff. I mean, I take what we do really seriously. I just don't take myself seriously. You know, mm-hmm. just, I think there's a little bit too much of that in this or, in this uh, world. It really um, is, hundred percent. So, but I, I'm very passionate about about getting this this specific information out. You know, which right. has nothing to do with a lot of other things that are other people are awesome at training. You mm-hmm. know, I, I've limited myself to this 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 narrow window that I find fascinating. Um, so, when when we started doing this in the military, it was a couple in military and law enforcement. What was really interesting was I quickly found out that. The more highly trained somebody is to, in the use of justified lethal force, mm-hmm. the 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 incidences of it's like with the police, the incidences of excessive use of force, or in the military, trying to trying to quote unquote pressure test things out at the bars and getting themselves right, in, yeah. in trouble, all that went away. What was really cool when you focus on injury to the human body and and you go into the areas that we're talking about. Yeah, I realize even at the at, even at the training uh, speeds that we do it, and we can get them pretty pretty good. You, you can ramp somebody up pretty quick. I mean, you start out slow and accurate, but right. you can get pretty pretty good. You realize that if you're taking uh, a, a, an injury to the pathological limit with somebody, they they learn right away. Oh, this works. This will you know, that, that would this, suck. Like, like yeah, that yeah. would it, suck. It, so it, so it's really interesting in, in the fact that the training was cooperative, not competitive. Yeah. Meaning I'm gonna allow you to use my body and you're gonna be able to go into the most vulnerable areas of my body because I but trust I don't even you. like it to let you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I trust you, I trust that you're gonna allow me to do the same thing. And I'm gonna do my best to model what the injury looks like so that you have this, this pattern. And what was fascinating about it was guys that were, like, like we had this happen in the SEAL teams. There was one individual and he was known as the hand-to-hand guy. He's a very good kickboxer, very good, you know, fighter, quote unquote. Well, we had another guy that was just a chief. He, he was a random chief. Really hadn't done anything in boxing, hand-to-hand, anything like that. We trained him up, and the the thing that got into was he. They were at a bar, and I mean, I'm just going to completely, you know, destroy what I just said. Yeah. Um, but he, they were at a bar, and of course, it was over a woman. Yeah. And the hand-to-hand guru expert started coming at him. And this guy just, you know, this kid gets knocked back a couple of times. And then he just, he said, you know, he goes, Tim, all I remember was Jerry just saying, if you can't think of anything else, just backhand punch kick. And, yeah. and, and Jerry, we did these drills where guys would just tear through people hitting targets on, on the human body. 
he beat the crap out of this guy. And, and, and everybody knew. And what's interesting is with that, no, no, I'm not glorifying this, but what I'm trying to say is the interesting thing about injury to the human body is it's, it's a great equalizer. None of us can handle injury to the human body. So nice. had it been a competition, had had that been like a formal kickboxing competition or anything like that, we all know how that would have turned out. Right. You know, but what was really cool was I learned that, you know, destruction as a skill set is available to everybody. Ooh. And and if you if you train destruction, um, you can. You, I have people in their late seventies. I think the oldest gentleman that got back to me so far is eighty one years old that that, uh -huh. that used this. And, and again, I, you know, what we train people to do with injury wow. and destruction wow. is um, is the idea that a predator gives you an opportunity. They have not injured you. They they you know you can still think and move, and they mm. brought themselves close enough to you because they do not fear you. And they don't realize that they've just given you this huge opportunity. And, I, and if I teach people how to exploit that opportunity, there's a good chance they're going to be able to save their own lives. And, and that, to me, was, was, was fascinating. And it's humbling, too, because I tell people all the time, hey, man, I truly am. I'm, I'm a master close combat instructor. I've trained just about everybody you have heard of and haven't heard of. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've had a great career. But if I walk out that door and somebody hits me with a pipe to the back of the head, I go down just like everybody else. Yeah. Violence mm -hmm. is only good if you're the one using the tool. And, and that's a hard thing for people to understand. Yeah. But once you accept it, it's, it's, it's truly freedom. It changes you know, because, the game, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's kind of how I, I got into this. I hope that covered it enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. And that was Okay, so again, the takeaways from this, you know, basically we were looking, you know, at the time, the group that I was part of was looking for somebody that could, you know, train the combat soldier and how to properly fight with her kid under the parameters that, that we we're talking about. Basically that somebody would be in country 60 days. They would be probably mildly dehydrated, if not, you know, dehydrated. Uh, athleticism would be out the window, their sleep schedule all over the place. And so the only thing they could re rely on is their body weight and the kit that they were carrying. And it wasn't until we brought this instructor in who looked at what injury to the human body that it all started to make sense and that it was a universal tool, uh, the destruction skill set, a universal tool for everybody and everybody could get results. So again, that's really the crux of the training that, that we provide and the focus of the training. So I hope these uh, two videos, you know, telling you about my background and then the background of how the system gets started. I hope that gives you a good idea of, of who we are and what we focus on. So um, anyways, I promise we're going to be back to your needs and your self-protection, but now you have the history. So all the best. Hey, please subscribe. Please share this. Please make your comments. Hit the notification button. And thank you so much for growing this channel as quickly as we've grown. All the best.